My name is Patrick Terry, and I'm the President and CEO for the Columbus Council on World Affairs. It's a pleasure to have each of you here today joining us from Columbus, Boston, Cleveland, uh, and around the world. Uh, it's a pleasure. Please join me first in recognizing our mission partners. Now, mission partners for us are those organizations that give generously, give over time, and are aligned completely with our mission of global awareness. That's Abbott Nutrition, Wayne is here, Battelle, Commercial Vehicle Group, Anisal is here, Greif, Honda, Ebel Agency, Kegler Brown, uh, Vanita and Martine are here, and Nationwide. Please join me in thanking these mission partners. And today is actually sponsored by two specific groups, Kegler Brown, and you'll hear from Vanita next, and EF Education First. Kate is here in the audience, Ra raise your hand, and Rachel Weed is there. Thank you for coming, coming from Boston. EF has been a longtime supporter of our Global Scholars Diploma, and we appreciate that support. Our next program, Shifting Sands in the Middle East, with Ambassador Kurtzer, who served as a US ambassador to Egypt and then to Israel. There is the sponsorship opportunity for that one, but most of all, we want you to think about coming on June 11th. Now, a year ago, we had a program here on global education, and we had students, about 40 students, from two local high schools here. The plan was to do that again. And the only problem is there's so much interest in the Global Scholars Diploma Program uh, that there's about 200 students right now over at Columbus State uh, participating in their culminating event. Uh, we didn't have enough room for this growth, so we're having two separate events. Um, but let me just tell you this. Right now, actually, the students finished doing a couple things. One was a session on taking action. What is a global issue you care about, and what are you going to do about it at, by the end of the summer? Who do you need to talk to to make it happen, and how are you going to get the word out? That was one of the sessions. One of the other, the second session was around uh, investigating news. So we, have six, we had six articles from news sources from around the world that groups could pick from. They assessed and analyzed it and then presented it to their peers who judged. Uh, and the third one was a fun quiz bowl. Of all the stuff they learned over the year, um, let's have a quiz bowl, and they had a, they had a blast. And the ambassador and I were over there um, looking around and telling them all about it. And um, right now they're listening to Shahed, who is a student recently graduated from The Ohio State University. She grew up in West Virginia. Her parents are Syrian via Palestine, or Palestinian via Syria. She's going to talk about life in West Virginia as a young Muslim Syrian. Today's format, as you're getting used to, is a keynote. And then we're going to sit down here and have some open Q&A. You've got note cards at your seat. Um, if you'd like, you can, you can tweet questions to Ask CCWA, um, which is being live streamed through, uh, through uh, our World Affairs Councils of America. And let me take that opportunity to, to ask Mara O'Donnell McCarthy to raise her hand. She is my counterpart in Cleveland, one of the other World Affairs Councils in the state, and one that we look to often for best practices. So thank you for being here. Now let me introduce Vanita, who's representing our sponsor. She's also a board member for the Columbus Council on World Affairs. Vanita Bara Mera is the leader, Asia Pacific practice for Kegler, Brown, Hill, and Ritter. Please join me in welcoming Vanita. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, thank you to EF Education First. And thank you to all of you for joining us today and being a part of this discussion about global education and progress. You know, as we know that high schools, universities, and colleges in Ohio are definitely making an endeavor and what's the endeavor? That is to make and provide our students with the necessary knowledge and experience that they require to compete anywhere in the global marketplace. Per the CCWA Global Report, which you all have on your table, some of the statistics which are very, very prominent, which is 77,000 K-12 students in the Columbus region are enrolled in language classes. More than 7,400 international students study at colleges and universities in the Columbus region. International students in the Columbus region come from 137 countries. And actually, according to NAFSA, Ohio international student population contribute $534 million 
to the economy, local economy per year. And actually, Ohio is ranked ninth in international student admissions. Wow, right? So this shows that the Ohio education system is definitely thinking global and is definitely trying to attract more students to come to Ohio to study and is giving a chance and encouraging our students to explore international opportunities to study abroad. And here in America, we have many proponents of this important issue, which is world-class global schools, global education. And one such prominent individual is at today's esteemed guest of honor. It is my honor to introduce to you His Excellency, Ambassador Ashok Kumar Mirpuri. Mahatma Gandhi had once said, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. And Ambassador Mirpuri has followed that philosophy diligently. Prior to his current position as the Singapore ambassador to the US, which he assumed in July 2012, he has take, represented Singapore in key positions all over the world, including as a high commissioner to Malaysia and Australia, as an ambassador to Indonesia, and he's also served as a director of policy planning and analysis for the Southeast Asia for the Singapore Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In 2010, he was actually awarded the Public Administration Medal, the Goal Award, which is by the Singapore government, the highest honors in the public administration. Ambassador Meepuri has completed his bachelor's degree in political science from the National University of Singapore and his master's degree from the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. He joined the Singapore Ministry of Foreign Affairs in May 1984. Mr. Puri is an experienced, vibrant senior foreign service officer who has made his country proud of his achievements because of his strong work, ethic, dedication, and unfettered commitment to public service. And he's also a keen golfer. So, a seasoned administrator, a dedicated and pious community leader, an honest and extraordinary human being. Please put your hands together for His Excellency, Ambassador Ashok Kumar Mirpuri. Thank you, Vinita, for that introduction. And uh, I'm a bit embarrassed, the association with Mahatma Gandhi, who we all see of as such a champion of world values. But there's something in my bio that Vinita didn't read. You know, She added some things, but left some things out. Because in addition to being a keen golfer, my bio does say I'm a very slow runner. <laughs> so just to put moderate expectations in terms of how things are, because I noticed that in Columbus, Lots of people go around running. I noticed it's a very pleasant city for running. Well, thank you for inviting me here to speak at uh, your Council of World Affairs. Patrick has been trying to get me here for some time. We met about two years ago in DC, two or three years ago in DC, and he's wanted me here to speak on education and Singapore's experience. But I came here yesterday eve afternoon. I had an opportunity to have dinner with some of uh, your civic leaders, and from everything that I learned and heard, you already have an excellent education system. In fact, I think there are things that Singapore can learn from you, rather than you trying to learn from us. And it's, it's really this intermeshing of communities and societies is the way forward. I had an opportunity to meet the mayor this morning. Uh, he spent a lot of time with me. In fact, our meeting ran, ran over time. And he's very keen to strengthen those links between Columbus and Singapore. So I think that one way that really these links can be strengthened, the easiest way, I told the mayor, and a, a way that will point towards the future is better educational links. Getting students to know about each other, because once they start knowing each other at a younger age, these are relationships that endure and go on for quite some time. Of course, I, I think I picked the wrong week to come here because I should have come next week when the Rolling Stones are here, because that's another one of my Passions is rock and roll. Unfortunately, Patrick didn't invite me next week. He said, let's do it this week. So it again points to what Columbus offers, you know, that you have young people who want to go to rock concerts. And I want to speak a little bit about Singapore's education journey. And I, I think the reason why I've been invited to speak over here has been because Singapore is considered one of the most successful education systems. 
if you look at all the league tables, and these come out regularly, the OECD comes out with these tables, there are PISA tables and across that. In math, science, reading, uh, problem solving, Singapore's uh, really comes near the top. And some of you may have heard about Cheryl's problem a couple of weeks ago that went viral, where people were trying to work out her age and things like that. And it's, it's very interesting because we've focused a lot of effort in Singapore in helping to build these students to come up to the top of these league tables. But I think a very understated fact about all these tables is that we're not leaving low-performing students behind. And that's been the key for us. If you look at these tables, the tables point out the highest ranking students. When we look at the tables, we don't look at the highest ranking students. We look at how our low performing students are doing. And Singapore is the country with the narrowest gap between highest and low performing students. And we really want to push up low performing students across the board because it's not just working with the peaks of students, which are sometimes easy, those of you who are teachers. It's easier to teach the good kids. It's much harder to teach kids who are struggling and giving them the opportunity to raise their standards because they have to fit into the workforce as well. Now in Singapore, and some of you here are familiar with Singapore, and there's some people here who've been born and brought up in Singapore, are familiar with Singapore, but not many people are aware about Singapore. And really our education system, this whole thing must be looked at in the overall context of Singapore's political and economic development. And the Singapore story is a very unusual story. Now, Columbus has a history that goes back over 200 years. The mayor gave me a book about the Columbus story. Singapore's history also goes back a long time. But we were a British colony when uh, the British came in the early 19th century and colonized Singapore and created a, tr a trading port. We only became an independent country 50 years ago. So this is our 50th anniversary, and it's a big celebration of these 50 years. But as we look back, I think there's a very deep recognition of how much Singapore has achieved in these 50 years. In many ways, my story mirrors the Singapore story because I was born in 1959, and when we got self-government, and at that time I was a British subject, and then I became a Malaysian citizen for two years in 1963, and in 1965, became a Singaporean, not by moving anywhere, as people do, but because the country changed. And it was a very traumatic process of independence. Unlike many countries that wanted independence, Singapore did not want independence. We were part of a larger whole, part of Malaysia, and we did two years at Federation with them. But the ethnic and religious tensions overwhelmed the Federation. And we were forced to leave Malaysia in 1965, and had to be an independent country on our own. We had a country without any resources, and we are a country still without any resources. I don't have a map here of Singapore, but you will see that we are smaller than your smallest state. We are smallest than Rhode Island, smaller than Rhode Island. And we're essentially a city state with five and a half million people. We have to import all our energy. We don't have any oil and gas resources of our own. And for a very modern city, you need a lot of energy. We have to import all our food. We have no agriculture. All our food has to be imported. And we have to import even our water. We buy water from Malaysia. And this became a matter of some tension about 10, 15 years ago when I was ambassador to Malaysia. And we sort of worked over the relationships and we have these long-term agreements with them. But we have started to also convert water from a vulnerability to a strategic strength by creating our own water industries. We've now become a global Hydro Hub, and I've mentioned to some of you that two nights ago in Washington, D.C., I was at an event with Procter & Gamble, an Ohio company, uh, because they have launched something called a purifier of water, which is a sachet that you put into river water that is drinkable within 30 minutes. And they do that only in one facility in the world, and that's in Singapore, a state-of-the-art facility. And they use it to reach out to disaster. They sent it out to Nepal recently. They sent it to other disaster areas. They sent it to Africa, where they have poor water resources. And that's really using Singapore's water skills. So what Singapore has done has taken all of our vulnerabilities and tried to make them strengths. I mentioned that uh, Singapore has no energy of its own. You may not be aware that Singapore is a global energy hub. 
with Houston and with Rotterdam, Singapore, is a global energy trading center because we have created a petrochemical industry. Major U.S. corporations like Exxon Mobil and Chevron and ConocoPhillips have invested in Singapore. Now, it was all not like this in 1965. In 1965, we had racial tensions. I remember racial riots in 1964 as a young boy. We had a very poor education system. We had no jobs. We had 20% unemployment because the main industry in Singapore in 1965 was the British military base and the British were going to withdraw and all the industries with them were going to leave. So we had to push into a very quick process of industrialization and converting the country. It's, it's high school graduation time and if you look at high school books, people speak about these students most likely to succeed or you know, likely act or Singapore would have been graded as least likely to succeed in 1965 because we had no resources, no hinterland, no military, no diplomatic service, nothing to start with. The only thing we had was a very practical leadership and a very determined people. So there have been two big themes in Singapore's success and why the Singapore story, people are curious to know about it around the world. And these two big theme, themes are pragmatism, that we will adopt whatever works in practice rather than theory. We don't care what the theory is around it, it's got to work. And the other thing is eclectism. We will learn from everybody and adopt the best models for what we have. And that's really been critical for where uh, we have and where our education has gone towards. Can I have the slide on page three, please? Well, what the slide will show you when it eventually does come on is where the phases of economic development match with the phases of the evolution of the education system. And you know, over 50 years, the education system has evolved. And that's a very critical thing of understanding education. You have different education systems for different times and different needs. The first phase of economic development was really from that 1959 when I was born, right through to 1978. It was very much driven by industrialization. The first priority, and I met Jobs Ohio this morning, the first priority for us in 1965 as we became independent was jobs. Because as I said, we had 20% unemployment and it was very critical that we had people into jobs. So we invited foreign companies to come in and invest in Singapore. The whole focus was at that time export oriented. Now, you will not be aware of this, but around the world at that time, there was a very strong pushback against foreign multinationals because foreign multinationals were seen as neo-colonialists. And what, they, what Singapore did was, in, in opposition to everybody else, we invited foreign companies to come in. Whether they were American companies, Japanese companies, European companies, they were all invited to come in. And we did not care what industries they had. The first priority was job, it could be textiles, it could be jeans, it could be very, very labor-intensive industries. And then at the same time, there was a very strong focus on infrastructure development. And then the key in terms of the edu economic education system was really survival driven. We wanted to get people educated to serve the jobs. And that was the challenge. Because when I started school in 1965, you had very, very elite based systems that couldn't uh, expand that into a broader range of people. And so the whole education system was really focused on broadening education. When I started school, and I was sharing this with some others who went to school in Singapore, we had to run two session schools because there were not enough buildings for schools. So you would run one session in the morning from 7.30 to 1, and a second session in the afternoon from 1 to 6.30, just to get more students into classrooms. Today now we can run one session schools already. But that was really the key, was a whole survival-driven aspect of it. Then by 1978, we could start to shift. We were sort of 10 years into independence already. There were already industries anchored in Singapore. Many US companies had already come in there and set up base. We could start moving to the next phase, which was very much a skills, capital intensive sort of industrialization. Then you started to be a lot more selective. As your people were getting ready to go into the workforce, into a much more specialized workforce, you could, we could restructure the industries and go much more into capacity building. And that was the second stage, and the education system became driven by efficiency. It was really a strong efficiency-driven education. 
to get, again, with a brick population, to get them all through, through the system. The economy was diversified. There was a focus on manpower development and a focus on training and education, again, to get people into jobs. The third phase was knowledge-based, and that's really where we almost come up to today. From 1997 onwards, very strong knowledge-based economy. The ability, the focus was on, there we go. So I spoke about the first one, your survival-driven uh, economy from 1959 to 1978, what I call that whole export-oriented industrialization. The second one, skills capital intensive, driven by efficiency. The third one, the economy was going towards a knowledge-based economy, and the education system had to go much more to ability-based, driven by students' aspirations. And we've now come to the fourth phase, which is innovation-driven, which is much more student-centric. And that's been a whole mindset shift, where traditionally the whole education system was top-down. Now the education system has got to change to be much more bottom-up. What do the students need? Where are they going to go? So we've moved from that knowledge-based area to the innovation-driven uh, area, and we've just launched something called the Smart Nation Project to create a smart nation in Singapore that will unleash some of the innovative spirit and entrepreneurial spirit of young people and people around to make sure that the, the country is ready for the next 50 years. Now, two months ago, Singapore's founding prime minister, Lee Kuan Yew, passed away. He was our prime minister from 1959, as we got self-government. Prime Minister in 1965 when we had forced independence, and then he stepped down in 1990. And this year, as we reflect on that 50 years, so much of the system was something that he set out, something he thought about, that you need to create a meritocratic-based education system that allows opportunities for everybody as they go forward. Slide number four, please. So this is where the education system then reflects some of the enduring truths. Education is the key in terms of supporting our economy. Because people are our only resource. I told you we have no energy, no food, no water. It's the only thing we have is our people. And education is then being used to prepare the children for the increasingly uncertain and globalized world. And so there's a close connection in order to develop all these these these, uh, to coordinate and, and to develop all these connections between education needs, manpower needs, industrial needs, while also fulfilling all those aspirations of the children and creating different pathways in terms of where people can go. So there's really three big themes in terms of where our education has gone. And the first one, if I can slide on seven, please. If you want to see what the education looks like today, this is what it looks like. It's no longer the straight, simple, you start elementary school and you make it all the way to university. You have your primary school or what you call elementary school over here, which is six years. And on the side, of course, is special, special education. Everyone does a common exam at the age of 12 called the primary school leaving examination. It's a highly stressful time uh, for the 12-year-old kids, but more stressful for their parents because it's sort of streaming that starts to take place. And, you know, there's positives and negatives about testing. The positives are it gives people a sense of what the standards, whether they've achieved standards. The negatives is the big stress. But then through that streaming, we've allowed to move students according to different paces. Traditionally, the schools took a broad range of students, better students and students who were less academically able. Now we are able to separate them and give them opportunities to go across the secondary years at their own pace independent schools, integrated program schools, and more specialized schools, including things like a school of the arts, school of the sports, school of music that give people a range. Then at 16, we do this GCO levels, N levels. These are set out of Cambridge, England, and we set our own exams as well for students to take. Then they move on either to junior college. Polytechnics are sort of a highly skilled community college in a context, but they've learned very, very uh, work-ready skills, or institutes of technical education. Then they pick up different skills. Those who go on to A-levels then go on to university. And those who go on to polytechnics, they're different routes. And the really big theme that I think that we have started to build is to make sure the system has become much more porous, flexible, and diverse. That you could start anywhere and jump in there and you could keep moving along. 
no route is closed to you if you cannot succeed at that particular level. You can take a slightly longer route. This is very different from the time when I was in school when you just had to get in the treadmill and you couldn't get off until it was university. And if you got off, you were left, you were left on the sidelines. So creating that. And then the most interesting part is now the green part at the top. Work and life and CET, which is con continuing education and training. And I'll speak a little bit about that because that's going to be the next challenge for us, as I'm sure it will be for Columbus and Ohio as well. What do you do after you've educated people through this whole system? And if you look at the system in terms of our lifespan, it's really a front-loaded education system. Whether you complete it at 21 or 23 or 25, you finish it there, what do you do for the next 40 years when you're still in the workforce? And that's where the work and life and continuing education has become our next challenge for the future. The other big theme of our education system has been bilingualism. English is the first language for every student, but every student also has to learn a second language, a second language related to their mother tongue. Because we are a multi-ethnic and multi-religious society, we insist that students, if you are of Chinese origin, you learn English as a first language and do Chinese as a second language. If you're Malay, you do Malay as a second language. If you're Indian, you choose one of the Indian languages. There are other options as well, but generally we want to have some of these Asian languages because we are there in Asia, because it connects our people to a globalized world, a regional and globalized world. So English, because that's where the globe is, and then the regional languages. And it was not always easy even to have English as the first language because we are 70% Chinese. And in 1965, people felt maybe Chinese should be the first language. And the reason why we left Malaysia was Malaysia said Malay should be the first language. We wanted English to be because of a very clear sense that with globalization, you needed English. And the third big theme, after the fact that the system is very porous and we've got bilingualism, and this is a theme sometimes underemphasized in other education systems, is the role of teachers. And teachers are the most critical part of our system. In fact, it's very difficult to be a teacher in Singapore. You have to go through undergraduate education, that specializes in a subject area, biology or chemistry or mathematics or English, then you apply to join teaching school. And you will, the teaching school will only take students, potential teachers who are in the top one third of the cohort. So you have to be the better student in order to get in there because the sense is if you want to be a teacher, you should be a better student. And by taking the one third, then they give them a year of teaching, teacher training. They're well compensated. They're respected in society. They're moved around different schools, which is easy to do in Singapore because of the small geography. There's a sharing of experience. There's continual training for them. Better ones quickly progress to administrative and principal roles, and then sharing that across schools. And so these have really been what we think is one key part of the education system. Getting the right teachers, focusing on the bilingualism, and getting the, the flexible system. Next slide number eight. But it's not all not easy going. So despite the fact that Singapore has got all the credits and everything, we, Singapore has survived as a society because we worry all the time. And when you worry, you start looking at challenges ahead. And there's some of the challenges outlined over there. I mentioned about the stress in the system because of the con continual examining. So how do you maintain that while having rigor? Education is always seen as a social leveler. You want to make sure the inequalities are narrowed what happens is that more successful people have more successful children. And how do we use education for that? The professionalism of the teaching profession, the broadening definition of success, where there was only one route to success, you had to graduate and be successful in a job. How do we broaden that? And then the increasingly uncertain economy that all of us face. And finally, the fact that you have to do it more public and stakeholders with everyone complaining. And parents complain, other stakeholders complain, and that's become a new challenge for the education system. So we're fairly clear about these things, but I think the biggest cha challenge is really the volatile global economy. And the whole, uh, the more information-rich agenda that students have to deal with. It was so much easier when you just went to school, checked the encyclopedia once in a while, had a single textbook to work on. Now it's Google and everything. How do you deal with students in that case? So that's really becoming the biggest challenge that we're dealing with as we go into the education system. Let me turn off the slides now. Thank you. So the focus has become in Singapore really that importance of technology and STEM education, that smart nation concept I mentioned, and then the continuing education and training. We've just announced a program called the Skills Future. 
which is a national movement to promote opportunities for people to continue to develop their potential. It doesn't matter whether you're a university graduate, a technical school graduate, a polytechnic graduate, you will continue to keep going back to school. And working with employers has been the key to get that. The most important thing is to change mindsets, that people must be ready to learn at whatever phase of their careers they're in, and letting employers let them go out to do these things. Now, there are other areas that we're starting to work on. One area has been global collaborations, and a number of US universities have connected with Singapore. Yale has set up a liberal arts school in Singapore with our university, the Yale NUS University, and that's been very successful. They've been running it for two years. And it's not just a Yale liberal arts curriculum that they teach. They teach Asian civilizations and Western civilizations. The Peabody School of Music in Baltimore has a collaboration with our Conservatory of Music, where students are exchange go back and forth. Duke University runs a medical school in Singapore with our university. The latest university just opened a couple of weeks ago is a collaboration with MIT called the Singapore University of Technology and Design to reteach, to relearn the whole subject of design, engineering, and architecture. And then there are constant exchange programs. We have several hundred students every year who come to US universities to spend a semester, and several hundred American students who go to our universities to spend a semester. And because of the flexibility of the language, and the high curriculum standards, it's so much easier to move people back and forth. We've also signed agreements at the federal level to collaborate in the learning of maths and science, in teacher development, in school leadership, as well as education research and benchmarking studies. So all this is really things that pull us together. And the things that pull Singapore and the US together, of course, straddle all of that. This morning when I spoke to the economy, to the mayor, we spoke about the Trans-Pacific Partnership that is going to link Singapore and the US even closer together. But I think education is really the, the way forward, the way that both our countries can work together, look ahead, and learn from each other of what the future holds for our young people. So I'll stop over there and happy to take questions. Thank you. As you get seated, I'll go ahead and ask the first question and remind people that they can uh, write their questions on a note card, hold it up, and we will come around and get it. If you'd rather tweet, uh, you can do that at AskCCWA. Um, and we'll go ahead and start with some of the questions. Um, Mr. Ambassador, congratulations on the 50th anniversary of the country. Uh, you are recently named by the OECD as the number one ranked education system in the world. You're very humble in saying you're near the top. Uh, you are the top, um, and you always talk about, and I remember this when we met in D.C., that, that you have no resources, and so your people are your most precious resource. Um, can you talk a little bit maybe about Lee Kuan Yew? Um, who was he, and what was his vision for Singapore, and um, was that part of his vision back 50 years ago? Well, as I mentioned, Lee Kuan Yew was Singapore's founding prime minister. And uh, he was a, came from a fairly successful family in Singapore. In the 1940s, went to Cambridge to study law. His wife and he both studied in Cambridge. And came back, and the whole nationalist movement pulled him into joining Malaysia in 1963. Now, Singapore at that time, which I didn't mention, was also facing a communist insurgency, as were many other countries in Southeast Asia. And the U.S. was fighting in Vietnam, but we had communist insurgencies in Thailand, in Philippines, in Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia. So when Singapore joined Malaysia, part of the reason was, in fact, dealing with the fact that you had uh, to deal with communism. So you had to deal with ethnic tensions, you had to deal with communism, and he did not envisage Singapore as an independent country. But as I said, because of these ethnic tensions, Singapore separated from Malaysia. And I think what drove him what drove him was his sense that Singapore had to succeed. He had been thrust into this leadership role. He had a team around him uh, who he, he worked very closely with. They had been put in leadership positions that they did not anticipate. And they had to work with that and the population they had in a well, poorly educated population. But he had a vision. And everything that, as I mentioned, when he passed away, we had an opportunity to reflect back on all his successes. His domestic and international successes. The US media had written very glowingly of him, what he had achieved, 
And around, when you look around Singapore, the institutional structures, building up a civil service, building up a meritocratic education system that fed into the civil service, you know, even the greening of the city, Singapore is known as a city in a garden. That idea was, all came from him about what needs to be done. He was a very meticulous man. He was, we were very fortunate to have a leader like him at the, start of our, uh, at the start of our birth because someone who took such attention to detail. And I worked with him closely for several years and uh, I learned a lot working with him. But you really had to be, make sure of your details if you spoke to him. Great, great, thank you. Uh, the, the, the question I wanted to ask is thinking about, you, you mentioned the new work you're doing and the importance of, the, of industry being engaged. How, how does your education system align with, support, line up with uh, the future careers and workforce in Singapore? You know, it's, it's difficult because our academic systems sometimes are not parallel with the work systems. And usually most employers need to give people on-the-job training to, to fill the gaps. You know, you could study philosophy and you're really not going to get a job anywhere in, uh, in the current tech industry. But the idea has always been that the system has to operate as a coordinated whole. So education, manpower play, planning, industry development, all has to go hand in hand. So there's plenty of interchange that takes place. And the skills future bit, this continuing education, is where I think you see it all starting to come together. Where people graduating out of schools may pick up new skills in order to fit into the workforce. And it's not, again not unique to Singapore. We've had teams go and visit colleges out in San Francisco, community colleges in San Francisco and in New York. And in San Francisco, people were surprised to find that Stanford graduates had to go into this community college in order to pick up skills that they could go into industry. And that's where the industry role comes in, because industry then says this is specific skills we need at this particular time. And I think that's where the sort of integration and coordination is starting to happen. We know that uh, for the high school program we, we lead, one of the things that the educators say is most difficult to get and most important for us to provide is that connection to industry. And I think um, your, your point about pragmatism is, is important because a lot, of, a lot of these students are starting to think about what, what's their job and yeah. they may not even need to go to college to get a good job is what uh, the workforce is like yeah. now. And so we're trying to make that relevant. And that's partly a challenge in Singapore as well because the peak of education was seen as college. And in fact, we've got to change, as I pointed out, one of the challenges is changing people's definition of success. That in fact, now at our annual sort of the State of the Union equivalent that the Prime Minister gives, he highlights stories of people who didn't go to university but are successful in their own fields. They, could, you know, they would have risen because of technical skills that they brought into. And that's really where I think celebrating these people rather than just the PhDs and the scientists who will be celebrated in other ways as well, giving people the opportunity to see that there are different routes up there. You know, Singapore has set up industrial parks outside of Singapore. As we changed our, our, our economy, we set up industrial parks in Indonesia, in Vietnam, in India. And each one of these industrial parks really show the model by itself because these are small industrial parks. But connected to them are usually institutes of technical education who are hiring these students straight out because they're working very closely with the institutes to say, these are the skills we need for the immediate future. Students are learning it, interning into these companies and then going straight to work for them. Thank you for the questions. I'd encourage them, them to come as fast as they need to. How, how does Singapore finance its education system? We have a public education system, unlike most countries. So we spend about 3% of our GDP on education. And the whole focus is really making sure that it is open to everybody. That's part of the whole meritocratic system. In fact, we have very few private schools in Singapore. All students would go through the public education. How does Singapore support early childhood development to prepare for entry into primary school? That's been a new challenge because traditionally, given that, you know, you, you saw the slide, we were really survival driven at the start and the focus was just primary education. We've realized now that, in fact, students coming into uh, first grade are disadvantaged if we did not have early childhood education. So we're starting to set up public childhood, early childhood uh, spaces where kids would then have some advantage of learning language and maths. Usually early childhood has been private kindergartens. Now we need to create public spaces that people can go into and send their kids into. Good. 
I talk with a lot of ambassadors, and you're probably the most straight to the point. I appreciate that. I see lots of questions, you see. Very, so let's just. Very good. Uh, I, I, we're going to be able to get through a lot of I don't leave people out. Keep them coming. Keep them yes. coming. All right, here's one. There has been a constant battle in Ohio and the U.S. on how to fund primary and secondary education. How are these education programs funded in Singapore? No, I it's, it's that one, right? well, Again, I think that I should emphasize that the systems are different. You have a different history, you have a different geography. We have a different history and geography. So I, I think it's important to see the education system in the political and economic context that you're in. And in a society, I mean, we don't have all the advantages Ohio has of shale oil and manufacturing. You know, you, we don't have those advantages. So we just had to work with people. So we were very quite practical about it. And therefore, the government had to step in and just fund the public education system. Please address the educational and other challenges stemming from the aging and contraction of the population. It's less an educational challenge. In fact, what's happening is that uh, less schools are starting to operate. As I say, we've gone from double session schools to single session schools. The aging population is probably a good thing because people are living longer. So I think that we should be happy. When the uh, life expectancy used to be in the 60s, today life expectancy is in the 80s. So that is a positive, better health, uh, improved uh, schemes of looking after older people. The challenge for us is what do you do as the dependency burden starts to shift? Where it used to be four or five people working for one older person, now it's down to two working for one elder person. And that dependency burden then means you've got to make certain choices. Do you raise taxes for the budget? How do you fund these older people? If they, most people in Singapore would own their own homes and we have set up spaces where they could congregate as communities, they're not left isolated. We have community centers. If you go around most of the parks, the parks have mini gyms that are geared up for older people to be able to use. But the, the key is that dependency ratio, that we have a smaller working population to support the aging population. One of the key aspects of the smart nation that I mentioned is actually going to be old age healthcare, building up center, sensor systems that will help them in many of the things that they do that they can continue to, be, continue to stay independent, but they have senses that can connect them to their children or for any assistance that they need. But it is a challenge, but it's less an education challenge, it's much more a societal challenge. Okay. This question comes from Twitter. It's which areas of, in yeah, it's from Twitter, but it's written down <laughs> old school style, just to, so I don't have to multitask. Which areas of interest are most popular with students at Singapore's univers universities? We wish they did more engineering, but I think they tend to do more business. So business tends to be a, but the focus, and that's why this new University of Technology and Design, really to push uh, engineering, mathematics, science for the future. But you know, it's a broad-based university. The National University of Singapore has, I think, about 35,000 students, not as big as the Ohio State University, but it's a broad-based, everything from medicine to law to the liberal arts. Then there are other universities that may be more specialized. The Singapore Management University has got business and law. There's a Nanyang Technological uh, University, which is engineering, accountancy, and then the Singapore University. Each one has slightly different, but a broad base of things. But I think more students tend to do business degrees, and less of them are going to engineering. So again, in the society, what we're trying to do is celebrate engineers, telling people there are opportunities. And again, part of that Smart Nation project is to create more jobs for engineers, so engineers will be celebrated. Got it. You have an advantage, I think, um, in terms of the bilingualism and multiculturalism. So when your engineers graduate, they're also bilingual. Um, we hear a lot about STEM here, and one of the things we always talk about is, um, you know, while you may graduate from the U.S. with an engineering degree, uh, uh, there's others graduating with engineering degrees around the world, um, six times as many coming out of China and three times as many coming out of India. And oftentimes those students are graduating with other skills that make them more marketable. So, um, But you only get advantage is that you all want to come to the U.S. I have thousands of students studying in the U.S., and I'm not sure how many of them will actually go back home <laughs> because they've got good jobs here. They graduate with good degrees. And, you know, in, in fact, there is, the U.S. is always seen as the most attractive place for, for immigration. And that's a very big advantage that you have. And Singapore students are globally mobile because of English, because of their language skills, because of their technical skills they pick up. So please don't take too many of our students. Uh, leave some for us. <laughs> Well, let's talk about that. You had mentioned there's some things that um, we can learn from Singapore and that Singapore might 
learned from the US. I know when I heard you in DC, you talked a lot about creativity on entrepreneurship and how to cultivate that. What, what are some things that you think the US does well? Um, well, you know, I travel around the country. I go a lot to San Francisco, and I see the startup culture over there. I didn't have a chance to visit any of your startup spaces over here, but I know you have them over here. Austin has them. You know, it's this idea of failure. In Asian societies, failure is seen as a negative. And over here, the idea of being able to try something and fail is actually seen as a positive. So I visit a startup space, whether it's in DC or California, whatever it is, and you'll have these groups of people bundled together as startups and someone watching over them. And they're actually looking for the guys who fail to bring them into their startup because they're going to learn from that mistake. Now, the Asian system has been really focused on you've got to succeed. Any failure is seen as a negative. And that's a very big mindset shift that we need to go over and get people used to the fact that you will fail, but that failure is going to teach you things as well. It's not only a con continual level of moving up s success. And you know that is difficult to do sometimes because parents' expectations are there. We're not used to our kids sort of taking a longer time to get through things or to try things out and giving that space for them to do that. So that's where part of that creativity aspect comes into our schools now, what we're trying to do, meeting the aspirations of the students themselves to got try it. different things. Got it, got it, good. What do you think, on the flip side then, what do you think we can learn from Singapore? I mean, you're, you're being very humble and you may not want to get too into it, but you, there's got to be a thing that you say, you know, the U.S. could really... I think the, the most important thing, and again, it's a different geographical and uh, economic context. The most important thing is probably globalization. I think your students are no longer able to insulate themselves from the world. The world is there. 95% of the world's consumers are outside the U.S. Your companies need to operate over there, and then your people need to be able to operate in those markets. It's understanding the world. You, know, you, you read the newspapers, and I watch these high school students just now doing their news analysis. And in fact, the instructor was telling them there's so little news about the world in the US. And most of the news is really not the kind of news that gives you a sense of what's happening outside of the US. It's how do you globalize your students, whether it's more language skills, whether it's giving them opportunities to travel, and see different places. It doesn't have to be Asia. It could be just Mexico or somewhere. And, you know, but I think that is probably a skill that around the world will help to make the world a smaller place, but make us all more, more comfortable with each other. I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm glad you picked up on that, the, the uh, analyzing the news. I, I got the idea. I was in, speaking at, about the Global Scholars Diploma at Harvard last uh, earlier this month. And, one of the presenters before me talked about what percent of news is international for Americans. Like, um, you know, and it's, it's like less than 5% of, of news that we consume is actually from international sources. So trying to build that up, yeah. that uh, the different and perspectives. You realize up. that the world watches the Americans very closely. That if you're watching news in Singapore or in China, actually American news dominates everything. So they know you better than you know them. China is larger than you, but you probably know them less than what they know you. And sometimes there's misunderstandings because they're not getting the full, clear picture of it. So you know, in, in Singapore, people watch American news all the time. You've got CNN and, you know, it's all available. We have International New York Times available over there. We have the Asian Wall Street Journal. There's big coverage of the U.S., but there's less coverage of Asia over here or any other part of the world. Got it. Great. We're, uh, we always try to stay on time, and um, we often we'll do a speed round. So okay. I'm going to try to fire questions at you, and you'll have got to say what, what comes to yes, mind no quickly. Media. Yes. <laughs> and uh, as I said last time, if any of them become uh, it's too outrageous, we can always edit the tape. Uh, at what age do Singapore children begin primary school, and how long is a school day and year? Uh, they start at 6. The school year is from January till November. So we've got a, the end of the year is the holidays. And the school day is, I would say, five and a half, six hours. I'm, I'm sort of lost track of the school system. Got it. Have you heard of this Singapore math program? Uh, this, this person says that her daughter's school just launched it uh, and wants to know how large is the industry for Singapore um, in terms of this Singapore math? Well, it's not a, for us, it's actually the way we teach maths. 
And some US schools have started adopting it. The textbooks are all available. It's very popular in California. It's popular in DC. And I'm glad that schools in Ohio have started to look at it. It is re-looking the teaching of maths into going back into basic concepts. And if you and I looked at it, those of us who studied maths the old way, we will not be able to help our kids. But the, once the teachers are trained, they can, the, the, the kids learn to break down the questions and the concepts and then rebuild it. And that's really become the most popular way of learning. But I, let me tell you a story, even though I know it's lightning that's around. That's okay, speed round's over, yeah. so now you can take So off. I had this young kid come around uh, for lunch because I, his, his family is from Indonesia and I knew his grandfather and the grandfather was in DC and uh, the son was studying at UC Davis. Uh, his, his, his son came along, a six-year-old. And the grandfather told his grandson, we're going to have lunch with the Singapore ambassador. And the grandson said, I don't want to go. I said, why don't you want to go? He said, I, I don't like Singapore. I said, why don't you like Singapore? Because it's Singapore math. That's all I do in school is Singapore math. And what's wrong with Singapore math? There's a lot of it to do. <laughs> so when you pick up Singapore math, just realize that, you know, there's a lot of it to do. That's funny. Well, better, better exporting that to our students than the Singapore sling, as opposed to... <laughs> which, is also, which is for which is also, our, our generation. Yes, the older yes, people will yes. drink the Singapore sling. Uh, there's 100 years old this year. So the Singapore sling. Yes, yeah. invented at Raffles Hotel. Yeah. Very impressive. Yeah, that's, that's just clappable. Uh, <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about, there's a couple of questions here about teacher and professionalism. Mm -hmm. um, what does professional development look like for your teachers? Uh, how do you make sure your teachers are the best? And conversely, how do you handle the not so best? Uh, my sister's a teacher and she'll tell you it's very, very stressful. Well, it is the education. You, you start with a university degree and then you go to teacher school for a year and you start interning and training to be a teacher. But there's constant, as I see what she does during the school holidays, go back for constant professional development that keeps them training and learning. And the challenge is curriculums keep changing. We keep updating our curriculum every six years. And every three years, there's sort of mid-term sort of review, which means teachers have to learn new things. So with that, they're better compensated because they have to work so hard. There is a sense of respect, as I mentioned, the community. And not just teachers, across the whole public service, let poorly performing ones get counseled and given advice how to move up. And some people do drop out of teaching as well. It's not something you necessarily have to do throughout. Uh, but the whole training aspect continues through their time. Learning new curriculum, shaping, sitting around, doing all sorts of additional classes. Is there, do you know if there, is there compensation uh, like performance-based or? They have both uh, performance-based compensation as well as uh, regular compensation. Okay. Okay. Most of our civil servants have performance-based compensation as well. There, there was a question here about from a local uh, business leader who came back from Singapore and, and was impressed how responsive government workers were. And he uh, had heard that it would, had to do with year-end bonuses that were tied to service, um, or tied to the rate mm -hmm. of GDP growth. Okay, yes. Does that, is it's, that it's, true or is it, that it's, a... It's less service. Service is presumed to be always 101%. There is whether or not you get a performance bonus, the presumptions, particularly for frontline staff, because generally most business people would meet frontline staff, that they give 101% in what they do. Whether it's in the embassy, if you call up the embassy and you get less than satisfactory service, people do write to me, but mostly they write to me to say what excellent service they had. Because, and that's, my staff are not uh, uh, given bonuses based on their performance. It's just an expectation that's there. But there is a linkage to GDP growth a small percentage of a linkage. We have other aspects of performance bonuses as well. We, like any other business, have targets. My staff and I, we work out targets for the year for each one of them. They're targets for me as well. And then this shapes some of our bonuses and how we perform, how we get compensated. Now, um, shifting topics a little bit, you, you get to meet with President Obama more often than I do. So I'm going to ask you, um, when you sit down together, what are the th what, what's he asking you? What are you asking him? What's the... Well, I, I meet President Obama with my prime minister. Uh, and I sit in through meetings with, between the two of them. And it's really for the two of them to talk about strategic issues, global strategic issues. When leaders meet, you first talk about relations between your two countries. And in Singapore's case, because the relationship with the US is so good, we can quickly move on to the broader regional aspects. Singapore's main interest with the US is 
You've helped us develop our economy. You've provided safety and security in the region over the past 50 years. We want you to continue to do that. The US as a global power, superpower, realizes it's got global responsibilities, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's Europe, whether it's Asia Pacific. And I think the leaders, when they meet, do talk about these issues. What more needs to be done to keep each other engaged, to keep the US actively engaged? What are the expectations of the region? And they share perspective from each other's regions. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the ambassador one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, we, we appreciate you each being here. Hope to see you on, on June 11th. We talk about the Middle East. Uh, we are adjourned.